Okay, good evening to all of you. I'm John Cavana of the Institute for Policy Studies. And as you can see up on your screen, I'm here with Rob Weissman, Annie Leonard, Mitch Jones, Karen Hansen Kuhn, and we'll be joined by Ellen Dorsey. But we're here to welcome you all to joining us, those of you joining us on Zoom, some of you on Facebook, to a celebration of Maud Barlow and a conversation among allies of her new book, Still Hopeful lessons from a lifetime of activism. There's no greater gift that our best progressive leaders can give us than to step up and step back uh, and really reflect on their life's learnings and share them with us in an entertaining way, through stories, through distilling wisdom and sharing it. And until a month ago, my favorite of these was our IPS board member, Harry Belafonte and his 2011 book, My Song. And I still love that book and recommend it to all of you, but my new favorite by far is Maud Still Hopeful. Why? Well, you're about to find out more about the book, which, which is written as a letter to her granddaughter on how to sustain and nurture hope in a time of much despair. So here's how we're gonna do tonight. And thank you all for joining. I get to briefly introduce Maud then she'll tell you a bit about the book and some of her insights for about 15 minutes. And then we'll start a conversation with our co-hosts and then with all of you. So get, as you have insights or thoughts, do put them into the Q&A box. You may be thinking, why are there six co-hosts from six leading US groups for the most revered of Canada's leaders? Well, you're about to find out that as well in what will be a bit of a love fest from the six of us who fell in love with Maude through decades of work together to take on some of the biggest forces of evil in the world. So after Maude speaks, each of the other five will get to ask her a question before we open it all up. Ellen Dorsey of the Wallace Global Fund, Rob Weissman of Public Citizen, Annie Leonard of Greenpeace USA, Mitch Jones of Food and Water Watch, and Karen Hansen Kuhn of the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. And finally, for those of you who don't know her, Maude is the best-selling author of 20 books. She's a counselor with the World Future Council and sits on the board of Mitch's Food and Water Watch and the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. She was a co-founder of the International Forum on Globalization where she was on the board with Annie. And she served as a senior water advisor to the UN General Assembly. She's the recipient of the Right Livelihood Award and so much more. Welcome Maud Barlow and take it away. Well, first of all, John, thank you. And thank you to the groups that have put this together and to everybody joining. Um, I'm deeply honored and honestly um, delighted you take time out of your busy lives. I'm also a little intimidated because I know that I'm speaking to some of the most accomplished committed, smartest activists anywhere. And um, you could just as easily be telling, giving me uh, advice and lessons. But um, here's the story about how I got started on this. You're right, it had to do with particularly one grandchild. I've got four uh, teenage grandkids and I also do a lot of work with young people. And I've been watching for a while now um, feelings of hopelessness that a lot of them have, hearing about the climate crisis and you know, the sixth grade extinction and 10 years left of the planet. And I think to myself, <clears throat> what would it be like to be 16 years old and be told that? Um, and they get it in school. I'm not I'm sure not everywhere, but certainly I know my kids are, are, are grandkids are all getting it um, full barrel in school and they know it. They, they, I mean, these kids are smart. Um, and I, in fact, <clears throat> started, I mean, I've been collecting material on hope and collecting books and thinking about the concept. And then in uh, June 2019, I spoke at a panel <clears throat> at a big old church in Ottawa where I live um, on the Green New Deal. And there were a lot of um, the, the panelists were people like David Suzuki and Avi Lewis and wonderful friends. And the place was packed and it was particularly packed with a lot of young people. And it was just an evening when the panelists were just down for one reason or another. And it was really kind of a, this is, you know, we're in a tough spot here. And I got up and spoke about hope <clears throat> and projects that I'm working on and 
others are working on that are that that are that are hopeful. And I had I got a good reaction from the from a lot of the young people. One young woman that here tears came up to me at the end, and she said, "You know, it, this is the first event I've ever." She was a grade twelve student first event like this I've ever gone to. And honestly, if you hadn't talked about hope, I'm not sure I'd have come back for another one. So thinking that night on the way home, it was a beautiful evening and the, the moon was silvering the, the new leaves. And I thought, I'm, I'm gonna write about this. I've got to, I've got to say what I've learned from uh, my years of, of activism. And, and one of the things that spurred me and one of the themes of the book is that the feeling of hopelessness that we feel when we're overwhelmed and we've got the pandemic and we've got the climate crisis and now of course the horrific situation in Ukraine is that you can feel that there's no hope. If you're hopeless, the situation is hopeless. But in fact, I argue that it's not hopeless. These are issues and, and creations of, of our of humans and we can, we can solve them. And there's lots happening <clears throat> and lots <clears throat> happening now that we need to know about and we need to be part of. So basically, I look at the three parts of my, my adult career, the second stage women's movement, the opposition to economic globalization, unregulated free trade agreements, and so on, and then the fight for the human rights to water and sanitation, and they blend to, to a great extent, but um, they, they really were kind of three di distinct uh, parts of my life, and I talk about um, hope and about the and then I have all sorts of, of, of lessons of hope or projects of hopeful projects that are happening. Um, and I came to a definition of hope at the kind of near the end of the book. I didn't start off with one clear definition, but to me, hope is a commitment to protecting all that is good for future generations and the planet, knowing that you cannot um, be responsible for the entire outcome of what's happening by knowing that you must put your hand out to mend the part of the universe that you can touch and having faith that others are doing the same, a lot of others that you don't know about and you can never know about, but you have to have faith that's happening. And looking back from when you write a book and John, you know this and others have written books when you, you write all this big book and then you have to learn how to say it in like 15 minutes or 10 minutes or a three minute interview. It struck me that I had three three major themes or three major pieces of advice. And the first is um, to define hope and not to define it as kind of a Pollyanna-ish optimism. In fact, I argue that optimism and pessimism have a lot in common because they don't require engagement. And I borrowed the term, the beautiful term from Joan Halifax, um, which is wise hope. She uses the term, this is a woman who got to talk about hopeless, she works with, um, uh, men on death row. She's an incredible um, uh, spiritual leader. Wise hope requires engagement. Wise hope requires um, that we uh, face reality, uh, right, right, you know, don't, don't pretend it's not what it is. Wise hope says to welcome grief. Um, and I talk about the need for grief and the need to have grief in our lives and to understand and to even build a place for grief, but not despair. And I make a distinction between despair and grief. I quote Clarissa Pinkola Estes, who says, I get, I despair, but I don't set a place for it at my table, which I think is gorgeous. She says, we are needed. That's all we can know. It's not given to us to know which acts or by whom will cause the critical mass to turn toward an enduring good. So wise hope also requires us then to be attached, deeply attached to the issue at hand or the particular campaign or struggle, but detached from the outcome. And that's really hard for me because I always want to win. I don't like winning, I don't like losing. And I'm very specific about what I, what, what I want to win. So this one's, this one's a hard one for me. But it's basically the notion that you, you have to have faith that you can't, know exactly how you're going to win or the way you want it to or in a time frame you want to but you have to have faith that moving ahead is 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 in and of itself progress um wise hope says that to when you're feeling overwhelmed you ask yourself what's the next appropriate step to take and and you take it and wise hope is a moral imperative it's really hard to build a good 
um, society, a just society. It's hard to build good science. It's hard to build a democracy. This is hard work. And those of us who live in a, a relatively safe, uh, er, uh, lives relatively safe from violence have a moral responsibility, I think, to bear witness to, for those who, who um, don't um, have the, that uh, protection. Now I do talk, I, you know, I've been in dangerous situations, but I don't live in a dangerous situation personally in my own country, and I'm very aware of that. The second major lesson theme is that we need to learn from the past. And as Rebecca Solnit reminds us, every major crisis shakes up the old world order and something new is going to come in. And this is a wonderful opportunity, but it's also a contested area. I live in the area of downtown Ottawa that was occupied for almost a month by the worst stupid, racist, misogynist yobs in the world. I couldn't believe there are that many of them in Canada. And they all ended up a few blocks from me screaming freedom at the top of their, freedom at the top of their lungs pushing women in, who had masks on into the snow to take rip their masks off. It was just appalling. You just, we just watched uh, Republican senators stand up and <clears throat> walk out when the first African-American woman was appointed to the Supreme Court. And we know what we're dealing with here. And, and so this is deeply contested, but it is, it is an opening. And I look to the Second World War and the hor horrors of the Second World War and what came out of it asking what can we learn from a, a horrific experience like that. And what came out of it was, I argue, the framework for human rights, starting with the 1948 Declaration, uh, <clears throat> Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the covenants, the social rights, the expansion of the notion to community and culture in, with the rights of, of indigenous peoples and so on. Um, and this, the climate and pandemic crisis exposed the very deep inequalities, the extremities, the inequalities that decades of economic globalization and deregulation and privatization have brought us um, and, um, and, and, and what cuts to social security and education have, have brought. Um, and they've taught us again, uh, coming out of what we're, we've been experiencing the need for sharing for survival, um, which I always argue is kind of Canada's founding principle. We, had this great big geographic area that was cold and hard. And if we didn't share, we weren't gonna survive. So we had to trust in government um, to build a railway and to, um, to provide healthcare and, and so on. And then the third sort of major theme or piece of advice is, is to the need to build a movement. And this is really important because we have to take the long view and I'm gonna be turning 75 in a month, can't believe it. And I've been active since I was a teenager. So I can honestly say, I, this is a piece of advice I know how to give. Um, and that is, it's, it's very important that we, that we understand that we, we can't um, judge something by whether we got what we wanted at the time in the way that we, that we wanted it. Change can come on suddenly, and it seems to be sudden when actually it comes after decades of real work by, by certain groups or, or many groups in society. And I use the women's movement as an example. My mother, <clears throat> three years before my mother was born, the Canada Elections Act said, no woman, idiot, lunatic, or criminal shall vote, if you can believe it. And, uh, you know, less than a hundred years later, phenomenal changes for women, of course not finished, but I mean, we, we, it, it comes upon us like a change in the weather, but it comes, of course, from, from deep um, work. Um, and yes, we need goals and plans and timetables and community communication tools, but we mustn't be rigid. I spend some time, uh, serious time talking about making our movement inclusive and diverse, which means that we cannot ask racialized and other marginalized communities <clears throat> to give up their struggle for the greater good or the good of the greater struggle. But at the same time, we have to incorporate their lived experiences into these larger struggles using their demand for justice as a bridge. And I, I argue it's never done. It's not easy and it's never done. And you think, well, we dealt with that and we can move on. It's, it, it's just the nature of our work and the nature of our lives um, to start to, in our country, for instance, reconciliation with First Nations and the uh, terrible abuses of, of particularly um, children who were removed from their families. This is ongoing, not gonna just 
it's not going to end at any point. But I've never in my personal life seen a desire for this reconciliation as deep um, as it is um, now. And then I spent a fair amount of time talking about kindness. And it surprised me because I didn't set out to. There's a book called On Kindness by an historian, the historian Barbara Taylor and psychoanalyst Adam Phillips. And they say that in our culture, Western culture, kindness, except with your, within your own family, is seen as a sign of weakness, that it's all about competition and it's all about personality and getting ahead and that our movement is not uh, exempt from that, uh, that, that reality. Um, and in fact, we know it's common in current social discourse to express hate um, for one another and it spills, of course, into our movements. So I write about how to build caring, like. Uh, deliberately building caring and building um, a way of caring for oneself and others within movements. And there actually is some very interesting work being done around how to do that, that we're not always campaigning and we're not always just charging ahead that we're stopping um, to take care. And then I write about signs of hope. Uh, and it was hard for me because I, I would start to say, okay, well, the water, there's this many people without, you know, and I say, nope, you get two paragraphs to say the bad stuff and the rest of it's got to be good. So it was a real, a real discipline for me to, to stay on, on the topic of hope, right? But I'm going to start with water, dear to my heart. We have had some huge successes. As you know, in 2010, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution recognizing the human rights to water and sanitation. We now have almost four dozen countries that have either amended their constitution or, or um, introduced new legislation to ensure the human right to water. We have a number of very important and interesting court cases um, that have used that resolution to promote uh, rights of water. Um, we have 337, the last time I looked, it might be a little higher now, cities and, and towns around the world, some of them big like um, uh, Paris and Berlin that tried water privatization, realized it was a mistake and went back to public management. We're actually winning that fight. Um, we had a, have a project called Blue Communities where a municipality pledges to protect the human right to water, not allow privatization and um, phase out bottled water where there's clean water coming out of the tap, phase out bottled water on municipal premises and events and so on. We now have 25 million people living in blue community towns and cities around the world. I've been monitoring, there's no one study, but I've been monitoring and I do believe that I can safely say that a, 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 a fair amount of money, aid money that's coming from north, uh, wealthier countries of the north or um, aid agencies to, global, to uh, global South countries for COVID relief has gone into sanitation. I mean, imagine having a, a local a health clinic with no running water. Well, imagine that anyway, but then imagine on top of that, uh, uh, you know, the uh, COVID coming along and having this pandemic. So it's, it, this is a very important um, development. And again, what can come out of a, a horrible thing like the pandemic, a, a consciousness, a, 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 you know, that the vaccines have to be uh, for everyone, that water and sanitation has to be for everyone. We can't fight it until we fight it for everyone. Um, and the, we're fighting the financialization of water. We've been working with uh, Pedro Arroyo, who's the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights to Water and Sanitation. Um, and um, through Food and Water Watch, IATP, um, IPS, a number of, of our networks, and uh, I'm honorary American here as chair of, of Food and Water Watch, uh, has been, we've been working um, to put together uh, a campaign and just very recently, uh, Representative Khan and Senator Warren uh, introduced a bill to amend the Commodity Exchange Act to prohibit water futures trading. So really, really exciting and important development because you may know the Chicago um, uh, Commercial Exchange uh, last, uh, last year, about a year ago, uh, allowed, uh, they, they oversee commodities trading, futures trading, they allowed new trading in Bitcoin and water, if you can believe it. So, and, and working with the UN Special Rapporteur, he's put out a several absolutely radical and wonderful reports on, uh, on, on who owns water and, and, and against the financialization of nature. We have not had, uh, and water. We have not had uh, 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 such a wonderful <clears throat> rapporteur um, in, the, in the past. 
on climate, we all know we're not where, where we're supposed to go, but because I wrote a book on hope and I'm speaking about hope, I want to say that I don't think the world has ever been more prepared than we are now to take the kind of action we need. We have the knowledge, the science is almost universal. Uh, those who don't accept it have been discredited. Uh, when at COP26, you had leaders standing up and sounding like people in the streets. The, the, I know that there's a huge gap between that and where we have to go, but there, ha there have been some very exciting changes. Um, we uh, new agreements on coal, new agreement on methane. Um, there's a, a treaty on plastics coming. Um, and at COP26, finally in the fi final text, they used the term fossil fuels, which they had never used before. We've stopped several important uh, pipelines, Keystone being one, which was really good cross country work with Canada and the United States. And in Canada, we stopped Energy East, which would have been the biggest bitumen pipeline in North America, bigger than Keystone, bigger than um, Line 3, big, bigger than any of them. And that was a, a huge um, win. Um, but what I guess I'm really excited about is the concept of biodiversity protection and restoration. There's all suddenly a tsunami of, of understanding, promises, pledges, money, treaties, plans towards protecting um, nature and, and revising and, 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 um, and restoring biodiversity. We've been concentrating in, around climate on the greenhouse gas emissions and fossil fuels, which we, we need to continue to do. But I've been saying since forever, uh, the abuse of water is one of the causes of the climate crisis. And if we take care of water, we stop desertification, we, 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 we reinvigorate local hydrologic cycles, uh, safe, clean, safe soil, protecting forests, protecting wetlands, protecting watersheds are absolutely vital, not just in and of themselves, but for fighting climate. And there's just a huge amount of exciting work being done on this. Um, there were financial commitments have been made both at COP26 and, um, and, and other meetings to shift fossil fuel subsidies over to uh, financing um, biodiversity protection. We have major commitments on reforestation, um, the so-called 30 by 30, that 30% 30 of the land and water should be protected in a, a biodiversity uh, protected um, by 2030. Um, we have very exciting new movements, uh, a man named David Boyd, who's a Canadian, I was also the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, um, has been promoting the right to a healthy environment. And a couple of months ago, the United Nations um, Human Rights Commi uh, Council agreed and adopted a resolution. Now we're wanting it to go to the full General Assembly, but we have many constitutions around the world that have begun to do this. And David's argument is that when you sign any kind of environmental uh, agreement through the UN or whatever, or what other treaty uh, systems, if it has a, a human rights lens within your own constitution, it strengthens it. Um, and he, he's written, I uh, would recommend the work that he's done. And then I've been working with the Global Alliance on the Rights of Nature, which has done, is doing wonderful work on the whole concept that we're, we humans are not dominion, don't have dominion over all else and we're not, you know, um, ab above nature, that we are part of nature. And we've seen nature and water as resources for our pleasure and convenience and profit and that, that absolutely um, has to stop. It's a very exciting work that I, there that I, I write about. I do want to just have one moment of non-hope or just a, a sh short um, um, warning because a lot of people are talking about what they call nature-based solutions. I used it in the book and then took it out, <laughs> put in biodiversity restoration because it's, been, it's being hijacked. Um, uh, just similarly uh, to um, offsets and to you know um, carbon trading and so on. Now we're talking about biodiversity trading. There's a lot of private money uh, hovering around this because they know there's going to be a lot of government money for it. So we just I just really want to I, I sound that alarm in the book and I'll sign, uh, send it uh, sign it here. And finally, I talk about what I call toward an Earth and human centered economy, which all of us all of us in different ways have been talking and writing about. Um, the climate crisis, the pandemic, now the horrific assault on Ukraine have exposed the lies 
that economic globalization would rise all boats, the big ships and the little uh, fishing boats. Uh, and this notion of unlimited growth should never be uh, really a deeply challenged. I mean, this was, this was our inevitable future. If you were around doing this kind of work in the 1980s and 1990s, believe me, you were just going uphill against the, the, the common wisdom. Even before the pandemic, the United Nations said three quarters of the world's working age population um, <clears throat> are in the precariat with no uh, secure work, no li living wages without benefits and so on. <clears throat> so, you know, the, the failure of this thing uh, was clear, obviously uh, clear before the pandemic, but now even governments, those governments, economists, institutions that promoted this model are ad ad admitting they were wrong. And I had a lot of fun writing about this. Uh, Paul Krugman declared that most of what he and other mainstream economists have been preaching in the last 30 years was, and I quote, spectacularly useless at best and positively harm harmful at worst. It reminds me of the saying, what an economist is somebody who can tell you today why what they said 10 years ago was wrong. So governments uh, are re-entering the picture big time. The for, in the first year of the pandemic, the G20 countries alone launched fiscal packages 30 times the size of the post second world war Marshall Plan. I mean, this is the money they put in to in their own countries and around the world um, to fighting um, the pandemic. The IMF and the UN Conference on Trade and Development, you know, where they've been, of course, have both declared that privatization and the creation of the global supply chains was a major uh, failure during the pandemic. They failed the world's people. And they've called on governments to dramatically increase investments in social security and healthcare of their people. Um, and it's really interesting. I mean, you read some of the IMF reports and it's like, John Cavana wrote this, or <laughs> not quite John, but you know what I'm saying, the unbelievable turnaround. Um, G20 countries are moving to impose a common tax on transnational corporations. Our campaigns against unregulated free trade and particularly ISDS are seeing some very exciting results. And Manuel, if you're on this, Call, I know you're saying it's still out there and I know it's still out there, but I think we need to say our movement has made tremendous changes. Um, ISDS was dropped between Canada and the US in the new North American agreement and weakened a lot between the United States and Mexico in that same deal. It was left out of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is the newest and the world's largest free trade area there was going to be ISDS, there was a huge fight back against it and our movement won. It is not in a deal that is now being negotiated between Canada and the United Kingdom, um, not even a discussion of it, CETA is not on the table. A number of countries, India, Australia, Uruguay, uh, uh, Pakistan, many others are either opting out or thinking seriously about it. And the European Commission had such, was, had such grief <laughs> over a promotion of ISDS that CETA, the Comprehensive Trade Agreement between Canada and Europe has been ratified in, in the whole, but the parts around ISDS have not been ratified in many, many countries. And I don't think it ever will be part of the full agreement. I, I just don't think it'll happen. Um, and uh, in fact, the European Commission called ISDS um, dead. Now I know they're trying to resurrect a court system, but as we knew it, we have made some real progress. And the World Trade Organization is so ineffective, we stopped chasing it around. I have a section in the book called um, Chasing Chasing the WTO, and I go from uh, Seattle to Cancun to uh, um, uh, Qatar, which is just right after 9-11, incredible story. Um, and Hong Kong, another incredible story. They're all incredible stories, but we stopped chasing them around. And the, the best uh, uh, description of this is from a journalist, Ferris Stockman, who writes in the New York Times, that if the WTO was a person, it would be that dude in the bar drinking the afternoon away in his business suit and wondering where it all went wrong. He used to be such a big shot. I love that concept. And your own Catherine Tai, the US trade representative, has basically said her job is to promote the rights uh, and protection of working people over 
consumers or uh, exporters, and that she wants to bring uh, supply chains home. So, and I write about, of course, the new uh, promote uh, promote the new new uh, forms of, of economic change. Uh, um, the donut economy, um, you know, many of you will know about. I go into to many interesting um, experiments that are being done, including uh, Amsterdam, which is which has done, uh, um, adopted a hundred year uh, donut uh, economy plan. Um, very very exciting. I mean, there are such wonderful uh, opportunities. So there are many openings for our movement, and the book is about um, the need to take a deep breath. Um, and to, uh, to continue to hope. And I have to say, when I thought this, when I knew this book was coming out in spring, I thought COVID will be two, over two years and hopefully it'll be on the downside. And I couldn't have, and it'll be spring. And I of course couldn't have imagined the horror of, of the uh, assault on Ukraine. And I'm sure like you, I'm, um, uh, fixated on it i try not to be but i'm and 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 the other parts of the world i mean from israel palestine to yemen to the uyghurs i mean to par parts of africa and of course the hunger is going to come from uh the lack of grain shipments and so on like the the domino effect of this thing is is really powerful and i thought shit i have a book on hope coming out just as this horrific war is, is breaking out. And then I thought, no, that's the point of hope. It's not for when times are good. It's not, or it's not only for when times are good. It's for, it's for, it's for taking a deep breath and doing what we can, to, as I say, touching the web of, of the universe where, where we can, where we are, and not, not thinking that we can do it all, but knowing that if we don't do something, um, then we're part of, of letting down those who so desperately need us to bear witness and be with them around the world. So I want to just end this um, with three very short quotes <clears throat> because they're lovely. Um, the first is, I have the war, the uh, assault in Ukraine in mind with this, although of course I didn't when I used it in, in the book. But it, the chapter is called Give Hope a Chance and it's from the Talmud. And here, is the, here are the lovely words. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. You are not obliged to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. The other two quotes, one is from our wonderful Banksy, the street artist in, in London. He says, when you are tired, learn to rest, not to quit. That's the take care of yourself part of it. Take care of yourself and, one, and others. And the last is John's uh, lovely uh, chair of John's board, uh, E. Ethelbert Miller, um, who's also the poet laureate for uh, uh, Washington. He says this, and I just want to end the formal part of this with these lovely words. He says, place your heart in your hands and blow gently. Spread, spread love like seed. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Maud. Um, and I'm, I'm going to turn it now over to your wonderful co-hosts, uh, Rob, and then Ellen, and then Annie, and then Mitch and then Karen. But before that, I just want to remind you all, this is a book party. <laughs> and um, several of you and several of the people in the audience were at Maud's 19th book party that Ellen hosted at the Wallace Global Fund for this one, uh, Whose Water Is It Anyways? And we were all got to chat with one another. And I remember Annie convincing Maud to come and participate in fire drill Fridays, which she did. And it was beautiful and got involved. a week later, I might say <laughs> a week later. Like, um, and so I do. Mitch has got a glass of wine. I hope the people in the audience do. I want you to know, Maude, that many of your friends are in the audience. Um, you know, Jerry Mander and David Corton and and Manuel is there. And 
uh, Ken Sarawiwa's son Kwame and Claire Greensfelder and Edgardo Lander and all these other wonderful people, but we we aren't you know drinking wine together. So I'm sorry about that. So I urge you all to drink wine, also to buy the book. Buy yeah, buy the darn book uh, here. Still hopeful, and um, turn it over now to Rob Weissman of Public Citizen. Uh, thanks, John. I'm such a treat, Maude. It's really, really sweet. And, um, you know, I think it, I would just say real quickly in, in, in our work and in talking to people around the country and supporters of public citizen, you know, I, I, I'm more and more focused on hope. It, I've come to sort of believe that our biggest obstacle is not the corporations, it's hopelessness. And uh, I have not had the chance to read the book, but I am looking forward to it because uh, I think, I think. You know, and part of the taking care of each other is uh, instilling hope in each other and sort of bucking each other up. And so, what a what a uh, an offering you've given us. I was um, I, I was kind of provoked by one thing you said, and I was hoping you maybe could elaborate on it, um, which was that you said the distinction between grief and despair. And I, you know, I'm, I don't know what the sort of the window on it is in Canada, but I assume it's not so different than here where um, I feel like, you know, we are suffering through this collective, well, collective despair, I just think that's, that's definitely true, true among progressives, but really in the whole country for a whole variety of reasons, but leaving aside even some of the climate things, just sort of living through the pandemic and the isolation and so many people um, lost to us and, and so many other people are just sick. And it seems to me that we haven't had there's not really any conversation about it. You got to kind of figure it out for yourself, but you just, but I think just people feel bad. And I think it's like, it, it trends us into despair and people actually haven't had any kind of barely even individual grieving because of, you know, the restrictions of COVID, but certainly any kind of collective. And I'm just wondering, grieving, I'm just wondering, sir, as, you, as you made that distinction, how you think about that and what kind of guidance and, you know, you might give us to think about ways that we can, we can do that, you know, for ourselves and, and, in our communities and, and eventually, I think really nationally and globally. Yeah, I'm just looking, I just love some of the quotes from some of the, what's such a joy when you start to write like this, you really are looking to others who have thought this stuff through. I've got so many fabulous quotes from so many wonderful people. I was just looking for my David Suzuki quote. This isn't it, but he also says, um, be good to nature and it will, it will it will be kinder to us than we deserve, <laughs> which I think is great. But on on grief, he and others uh, talk about the need to 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 formalize it, like recognize that you have grief, recognize um, that this is hard work. That you know the opposite of grief isn't uh, it isn't a, you know a, a Pollyannish optimism. It's 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 itself. It's it, it's part of hope. You can't have hope without recognizing what you're dealing with. If you're really gonna look at what you're dealing with, it's gonna upset you and you have to grieve. But you, David and others talk about grieving in community, coming together and talking it out. So we tend to be in our movement, just moving forward with campaign. And I'm, I'm like that, like get busy and don't talk to each other, <laughs> you know, it's just a work. We have to build in uh, ways to take care of each other, ways to allow this grief to manifest itself, to talk about it, to, to, to share the, these feelings. Despair is different. Despair means I, I'm, I'm paralyzed. I can't do anything. Grief means I'm facing it. I'm, I'm sad. Uh, I'm angry. Um, you know, I, 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 you know I, 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 I'm not sleeping at night. This is grief. But despair is that oh, there's nothing I can do, so I'll just walk away and I'll, I'll either be depressed or I'll just pretend it's not there. And so I make the distinction. I think it's a really important one, but I, I, in answer to your question, I think it's important that we build it in, that we actually build in ways to talk to each other in our movements. And sometimes that'll happen spontaneously. You go out for dinner, you go for a beer, you go for a walk, maybe. But um, I talk about the need to build in um, processes um, for burnout, um, for fatigue, um, for, um, for grief. And uh, I, 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 the harder things get, the more we need to do that. Um, 
in a formal way. Thank you. Thanks, uh, John. Before you, before you bump over to the next one, I just want to say, Maud, you can quote anybody else you want, but we're quoting you. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, also, the distinction between um, optimism and well, you get into optimism versus pessimism, but and wise hope. Uh, fascinating distinction um, by the book. So now turning to Ellen Dorsey, the hostess of the last book of that, who uh, is with the Wallace Global Fund and is a water warrior uh, like Maude. Hi, Ellen. Hi, Maude. So, so good to see you. I'm so honored to be here um, with my colleague, Kwame, who was mentioned, and the other co-hosts who are, are friends and people who I look up to as I look up to you um, to celebrate your remarkable book, A Tour de Force, profoundly inspiring as your remarks were here tonight. I have to say, honestly, I personally really needed this. Um, you know, we're all struggling with very dark and urgent and threatening forces and, um, it's for the first time in my life, I've felt the weight of it more than I have in the past. And maybe others are feeling like that. And we needed this. And I just want to say that that doesn't surprise me. It came from you because I, everybody laughs when I use sports metaphors, but you've always skated to where the puck is going, not where it is now. <laughs> and, and I really don't even know hockey that well, but you know, you get the point, Maud's visionary activism has always inspired and mobilized others for decades. Your leadership on trade, on globalization, developing a new international human right to water and fighting privatization of water and the water justice network that I'm proud to have, you know, partnered with you some on. We see your strategic brilliance and a moral, ethical compass that always points perfectly due north. You're guided by a profound understanding of the intersectionality, the deep intersectionality of our struggles, the urgency of the corporate capture of govern governments and systems around the world, and the requirement we all have to follow communities and their strategies first to guide our activism. So I always want to talk to you and ask you questions about a million things, including geeking out about ISDS and how we break that system of, you know, corporate courts that control the world. But actually, what I really want to ask you is how you remain so radiant from that deep, deep beauty inside and outside, so positive, so energetic when you hold so much and we all come to you for your knowledge, your insights, your strategies and your time. You take care of so many in the movement. So how do you really take care of yourself? What re-energizes you and gives you that hope um, and in, in a deep personal way or maybe who? Wow, Ellen, thank you for those gorgeous words. <clears throat> Not so eloquently, one of my former executive directors said about me figuring out what are the issues that are coming up as I was, he always said, you're always one step ahead. He called me a truffle hound. <laughs> I like your words better. <laughs> um, thank you, Ellen, for those lovely words. I, you know, I, I, I attribute a lot of it to my mom and dad. I have a lovely family and I am so aware that that I was gifted that way, not money wise, but just fine people. My father, my mother's father, my mother's first husband was killed in the second world war. They were just married. She didn't even know she was pregnant and off he went and he was killed in the battle of Britain. And she went to move back in with her parents and had my sister and, and um, my father uh, saw five really hard years. He was in the battle of Ortona, he was wounded and came home uh, absolutely determined that he that he said we're not going back into work camps. The same country that could couldn't feed, house, clothe, or employ people before the war had all the money it needed to send them to war. We're not going back to that. And he he became a a, a, a criminal justice warrior. He he um, 
from one of many things he did was that he led the fight against capital and corporal, corporal punishment. He was at the last uh, cor capital punishment in Canada. It was 1962. It was a double hanging at the Don Jail in uh, Toronto. And he was there with the picket. So I come at this honestly. And it just was fed to us with our oatmeal in the morning. You know, you, you, my mom went through a, a very hard time having lost her first husband, not knowing he was dead. Two years later, the trunk came, that kind of thing. You know, so those that 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 generation went through that time, and and that they could build, that they could they could build a a, a universal healthcare system here, universal pensions, you know, take us out of take most most Canadians out of poverty. We've we're dealing with all the same things everybody else is, but we really had that wonderful spate of time after the Second World War when people like my dad um, just transformed this country, and and so I see that it's possible. And I guess I just learned with my morning oatmeal that you owe something back. Um, and honestly, Ellen, it's the people I mean, it's you, it's the people on this call. It's getting off a plane in a city or a town I've never been in before, being met with by somebody I've never met before. And that instantly they're like family because we share certain values and just knowing that we need to be there for each other. And through the pandemic, when we haven't been able to see each other very much, just knowing that you have that history together and that you've, you've built that trust together, you can say, can you do this? Can you do this? Can we build this together? And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a gift. And uh, I, I, you know, I think it, being an activist is a gift. You get up every morning caring about something more than yourself. And I am convinced it keeps you healthy. I really am physically, mentally, spiritually healthy. But that doesn't mean you don't need to take the time when you need to do it. And I have lovely partner, family, friends, nature, good books. <laughs> All that stuff. But thank you for your kind words. You've been a great, great friend and ally, Ellen. That was beautiful. I'm also doubly impressed that Ellen figured out a Canadian sports metaphor <laughs> to use there. So, wow. Okay, so to Annie Leonard, the creator of Story of Stuff and Fire Drill Fridays and the co executive director now of Greenpeace USA, turning it over to you. Thank you, John, and thank you, Maud. Thank you for writing this book. I have to say I felt so much better when I finished it than when I started it. And thank you for the um, laundry list you just did of things that are going well. I feel so much better now than I did 47 minutes ago. Um, so I appreciate that. I have a friend who often says, it is hard, but not hopeless. Mm. And sometimes lately, I've questioned that. Mm -hmm. The first time in 35 years of doing this work, I've been questioning that. And so as, um, as Ellen said, I, we really needed this book. So thank you, thank you for the book. Um, as I read it, uh, you touched on a lot of topics that are in lots of books about activism. I love reading books about activism. You talked about strategy and protest and policy and corporate power and all that stuff I love. But there was another theme through the book that really came through that I thought was unusual in a book about activism, and that was relationships. Mm -hmm. And you talked about friendships, about laughter, about good food, uh, about long drives, about holding the hand of a stranger in a hospital bed as she wept. And I, I kept I kept more over and over, it kept coming up this thing about relationships. And I really appreciate that. In my own um, struggle to stay on the grief side of despair, um, the two things that most help me are um, at being an activist and the relationships that I have, including with many of the people on the screen. And so what I wanted to ask is if you could say a little bit more about the role of relationships and the power of relationships and how in your life they have helped to sustain your activism and your hope. Well, just thank you again. Um, this these lovely words, Annie, you're all touching me very much. And I, if I, if my book gave you hope in a, as Rebecca Solnit's book title, which is the best, uh, hope in a dark, uh, in the dark, um, then then good. I'm glad because I think right now we all really need to do this with and for each other. 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, it, it is all, and, and this is gonna be something when we're conscious of flying and our carbon footprint, because there's nothing that takes the place of that in person, going out for a beer after a long evening, uh, taking a walk, uh, staying at somebody, you know, stay, have, having dinner at the house of somebody in another country and getting to know their family and getting to know who they are. You build trust and it's just incredibly important when the time comes for real action to have, to have that um, trust built in. Um, but I, I guess I want to say that I think we need to do that formally. It's kind of like what I talked about with burnout and grief and being kind. I think we need to build it into our movements perhaps more than we do. We, we think maybe this all just happens. I talk in the board in the, in the book, for instance, about boards. I think boards often get a short short shrift, you know, they, they get blamed, it goes the board, you know, and I've heard it in my own organizations, uh, the young activists blaming when they can't do this and that and the other thing and, you know, the damn board. The boards are, are we're not paid, we're not like Exxon or you know, Amazon or whatever, we're not paid to be on a board, we're, we're there because we care. And so to, to, to take time to, 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 to be nice to your board. When we, when the Council of Canadians where I've, I've left now, retired from, but every year we would have an annual general meeting and on the Saturday night, we would have a big celebration and we would have tables with good food and we would have um, music and we would have speeches and we'd have something funny and we'd have something moving and we would have a celebration together. And it was my absolute, um, um, uh, not request, demand that it be fun and, and moving at the same time and celebrating each other. You have to build that in. And I, I think we don't do that enough and, uh, and we suffer from it. Um, but the, the human interaction in the end is, is that's the trusting that I talked about earlier. You just, you don't know where it's coming from. Or as Rebecca Solnit says, uh, uh, progress isn't an army marching forward, it's a, it's a crab scuttling sideways. It's hundreds of years of, a, of, a, of, of water on a stone reshaping the stone. Um, and, but we have to, you know, we have to, um, we have to find love and we have to, it, these are hard times. These are hard times. The, the, there's something brutal out there in terms of the discourse. Um, you know, you make a, a, a statement about something and then all of a sudden the trolls are after you and, you know, the, it's appalling. And um, we're needing to find ways to nurture and care for ourselves, but nurture and care for each other. And I, I, um, I, I, I just think taking the time and building it in consciously is incredibly important to do. Thank you, especially because I'm on the board of two people's groups on this page. So I really like <laughs> the plug for being nice to your board members and appreciating them. Thank you. I just want to say it's true that it's brutal out there. And too often it's brutal in here too. That's and, absolutely. And I mean, we one of really the be kind. That I've noted that, and I know we all have, is I believe that sometimes the, the, the attacks within our movement on one another are because people feel helpless to deal with that out there. That's too big. I can't do anything about that, but I can, I can go after you. So you're not pure enough or you're not, you didn't do enough or, it, or we drop a piece of gossip or poison or whatever. It, it's, you know, we have to find ways to, to build in, um, you know, we have to deal with real issues. Of course, I'm not saying that we don't, but often it's just, it's just unkindness, viciousness, um, a lack of, of, um, of feeling that you, you're, you'll be heard so you, you know, you have to find a way to do that and it might not be the best way to do that. More and more when I think about building um, manuals, employment, you know, it's, it's not just about stuff on paper, it's about setting aside time to find ways to, to, to deal with these issues. Because I think you can generally if you take time and it means taking time sometimes away from the work, but that's okay too. The work will be there. Beautiful. Okay, so I'm going to turn to Mitch next and, and then finally to Karen. And then we still will have time for questions from uh, the audience or thoughts or comments. A few of you have been putting nice comments in the chat. But if you have questions, um, do put them in the chat or the question and answer and we'll get to them after after Karen. So turning to Mitch, who has brought his wine. So 
be inspired by that, everyone. Get your mind. I, I, I appreciate you calling me out on that, John. That's, <laughs> yeah, I didn't need to put it in the coffee mug. Um, but thank I know you, it's, in a, it's in a teacup or a coffee cup. It is. It's actually one I picked up in Berlin the last time until this year that the SPD actually won the election there. So it's, you know, um, picked it up for a euro. It was great. Um, and... You know, we were just in a board meeting together yesterday, Maud. I'll try to make it more fun next time. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, obviously we worked together. And Maud, when she mentioned the, the legislation that Senator Warren introduced on the uh, water futures, which is called the Future of Water Act, by the way, um, is the name we finally landed on after three iterations. It's being a little modest because the idea actually originated in a, you know, there was a campaign going on and it was focused on regulation, uh, which is very important on this issue. But Maude and I were talking to a German reporter last year and she asked us, well, what can be done? And Maud said, well, as campaigners, we need legislation. And that was actually the, the kernel for that idea that then, um, my brilliant colleague, uh, Mary Grant, who was mentioned in the book, I appreciate that mod and she does too, um, ran with that idea. Um, and we were able to get Ro Khanna and eventually um, Liz Warren to agree to introduce that legislation a month ago, I think it was. Um, so, you know, that really did originate uh, with, with Maud and her commitment to activism and to the idea that we need to be able to campaign on these issues in a way that people are going to be able to understand and to be able to move uh, elected officials and decision makers. Um, I loved the book. I sat down and read it in, in a single go um, over the weekend. And um, I will note that I cheated and gave Maud a heads up about what I was going to ask after our board meeting yesterday. But um, so, you know, and I'm gonna have to take my glasses off so I can actually see the question. Uh, so when I was reading the book, I noted that you came back to and emphasize in, in my reading anyway, two particular things. One of those is the fundamental importance of planning for campaigns, for laying out a vision, setting a goal, developing a strategy, determining tactics, you know, all of those things that we activists do. And the other, the one that applies to hope, is the centrality of uncertainty that you highlight in hope. At the center of hope is this uncertainty, because otherwise it's, you know what the outcome is going to be. There's no reason to hope. There's this uncertainty. And so what I wanted, as you know, <laughs> was for you to say a little bit more. I had this great professor in grad school who always said, say more, say more. Um, I want you to, you know, say more about how you see those two things, the importance of the planning for a successful campaign and the centrality of, of uncertainty in hope interacting in winning campaigns. Well, thank you, Mitch. And it's a <clears throat> huge pleasure to work with you and Winona and Mary and, and everyone um, at Food and Water Watch. Um, yeah, it sounds like a contradiction at first, because as any good campaigner knows, if you want people to come in with you, you have to say, this is what we're aiming for. This is the, this is the change that we want. It might be a particular specific legislative change. It might be stopping something bad from happening, but, or, you know, it, but, but, you know, you have to, you have to articulate that you have to take time and get people to buy into your to a common understanding of the, the situation. That's a really important part of it. Just don't rush that part so that you, you've really built that on, on the ground. Um, and, and yeah, it's good to have timetables and it's good to have a plan and it's good to articulate that because that's what they're gonna be, bring people in. But when you don't get what you want, you can't be derailed by it. You can't be devastated by it. You can't say, well, I, I, I'm exhausted. I did everything I could and, and, it, and it didn't work. That's where the, the long-term visioning comes in, the long-term thinking. And I go back to trade agreements. I, I was deeply involved in the, trying to stop the first free trade, modern free trade agreement between Ronald Reagan, 
uh, US and in Brian Mulroney's, Mulroney's can, uh, Canada, both right wingers, Margaret Thatcher types um, in the 1980s. And we fought like hell. And we changed the hearts and minds of Canadians. The majority wanted free trade. And a year and a half later, the majority of Canadians were opposed. And we had three parties and the opposed split the vote between two and the Conservatives got in and we got the free trade agreement that m morphed into NAFTA, that became NAFTA. And again, that's when we started working with every, all you guys, so many of you, John and others, um, uh, and our Mexican uh, colleagues to try to stop NAFTA. And we, and our, our new, brand new liberal prime minister, Jean Chrétien had promised there would be six major changes to NAFTA or he would never sign it. The very first thing he did when he became prime minister was sign it without the changes. I remember he didn't even look at the cameras. He looked down because he knew he lied. Um, so we were, we lost both of those. Now at that point I sat down and I wrote, we had, I guess about five or 6,000 members, much smaller than now. And I wrote them and I said, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna fold the organization? I'd go on fighting um, because there's gonna be all the outcomes of this. And the people were overwhelming. Absolutely not. We didn't, it doesn't matter that we lost. I mean, it does matter. It matters more that we stayed because we, because we lost. And we went on to build internationally because of NAFTA and our connections in Latin America an incredible movement that stopped the free trade area of the Americas. And that was direct uh, relationship with, with the movement in, in, in North America. Uh, we stopped, spectacularly stopped the multilateral agreement on investment, which was an investment agreement of the OECD that would have given all the countries of the, all the corporations of the OECD, all the same rights to sue governments that, that existed now in NAFTA. And I remember when I first found out about it from Martin Kaur at the IFG and I came home and I called my trade minister and I said, you know, is this, is this true? Is there say, oh, you and your conspiracy theories, he said. And I, re I just think when I hear that of the two cows on a hill and one of them is reading and the other says, oh, you and your conspiracy theories, but the, what he's reading is a pamphlet that says where beef really comes from, right? <laughs> like uh, something smells in here, I can feel it. So. Sure enough, in a brown paper bag, we get the document from, uh, I always will protect the source. Um, and there it is that our government had been negotiating the multilateral agreement on investment with our business sector for three years. It was like 90% done. We put together an amazing coalition and we stopped it. And I remember, I, I remember the, uh, the, on the front page of our major newspaper, the Golden Mail, the, the, the quote was like, who are these people? It's like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Who are these people? Where did they come from? How did they stop this? And we stopped it. And that's, that's when I understood. It was fighting through that, that you don't, you're not gonna win the first time. And we had very clear, we had wonderful materials for the, for the, um, for the Canada US free trade uh, deal. You know, Canadians go A, so we had the free trade and said no A with the banning it. And we had comic books that we put into millions of people's homes. Like we had a fabulous campaign and we won the hearts and minds and we lost the campaign. And that's where I learned you stay with it and you don't know where a victory is going to come from. If you build and you bring in new people and you are adding to the research and the information that you have, and you're getting out more information to people, you're building towards something eventually that's going to work. And you know, the new uh, North American agreement, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a pile of shit actually. And Biden's breaking it all over the place with his Buy American and we're all saying, good, go for it. It's, things change and we have to, we have, to have faith that if we're right, it will be there. You know, we'll, we're going in the right direction. So for me, having won some, lost some, lost, won in the long term, and you can't even call it winning because they just come back at you in another form. You know, they're going to, they're back at the WTO trying to get ISD uh, again. Um, it, you, you just, you have to stay with it and you have to continue to do your work. And that's the co combination of really being, having the planning, having the vision, being clear about what you want to do, but saying, you know, oh, yeah, okay, I'll take a week. <laughs> I'll take a couple of weeks or I'll, you know, go drink a whole bunch of wine. I'll join you, Mitch. Um, but I won't give up. And this is, this is the long-term social change that we need. And I do believe that the, sh the, the shine is off 
the free trade rose. I think ISDS were on we're on our way to to winning that, um, and that's been a huge fight. We're winning the the privatization issue around water. The fight we're in now, or the struggle we're in now, is the declining quality of available fresh water. We're kind of in a time uh, a time frame struggle around that because we're trying to catch that. But in terms of um, are we winning that? The, the, the political argument, you bet. Um, so change happens. And that's why I, I, I talked about the women's movement and the phenomenal, I mean, I, when I was growing up in the 1950s, and this was the same for women in the US, my mother couldn't get a driver's license, open a bank account, or get a travel visa without my father's permission and signature. I mean, I, so I grew up with a foot in that world and of course a foot in, the, in this world. Um, and it, you know, it was a struggle and I was raised to be a good, you know, to be good and to be pleasing and all of that. And I remember, but, but I had these strong opinions and I remember the very first time I was ever really criticized publicly, actually it was in the Globe and Mail, some right winger went after me and I was feeling really sorry for myself. I talked to my mother and I said, mm -hmm. she said, you cut it out. She said, serious people have serious enemies. And I thought, where'd you learn that? No, where'd you get that? So it's, it's, you know, change happens and we, we, we can't shape it always the way we want it to. And so it's an attachment to that vision, but being open to the way you need to change and, and, and what you need to do to, um, to, get, to, to get there eventually. That's a great question though, thank you. Because it does sound like a contradiction. And for me, it's a constant struggle. Just one last thing I write in the book about visiting a 99 year old friend of mine just before she died. Uh, her husband and she had, had kept Walmart out of Guelph, Ontario for years. They had this huge campaign. He was an educator, a retired educator. They were very proper, very radical, but very proper. If you phoned them, he, you, you, he, the answering machine would say, you've reached Dr. and, Dr. and Mrs. D sorry, Dr. and Mrs. Vi Mor Griffith, Dr. Griffith and Vi Morgan, that's what he'd say. Um, and he, and he uh, when he was 89 years old, spoke at passionately at an anti-Walmart uh, event in Guelph. And as soon as he finished his speech, he fell dead, dropped dead right off on the stage in front of everybody with his boots on. And the next day on the front page of the newspaper there, the Guelph Mercury had a picture of me and Vi and, and Griff and, it, and the mayor saying now, heaven safe from Walmart, which was quite, quite wonderful. Anyway, when I went to visit Vi, just before she died at the age of 99, she said to me, have you got a quiet mind? And I said, no, I don't, Vi, I'm looking for one. You know, this is my struggle, right? Because I, I say that we need to disassociate from the outcome, but I, I hate losing, right? She said, you'll have a quiet mind when you trust that others are doing things that you don't even know about, when you understand that there's a, a spirit out there. I don't think she meant it in a religious way, in a, but there's a spirit out there. And you have to trust um, and do your part and find your quiet mind, which I, I uh, love, loved her. By the way, all those stories are in the book <laughs> that you just heard. Um, and including, I mean, the fascinating thing, the one that um, Maude just talked about, NAFTA, and I, I bet Karen gets into this. Um, when we lost that vote for NAFTA, Maude was there and we were on the steps of the Capitol and we lost by two friggin' votes. And it was Bill Clinton just on the phone buying off Congress people. And we were devastated. And I remember this wonderful congressman from Michigan, who many of you know, David Bonnier and Maude were the, were the ones who rallied and stood up there. And Maude gave that speech, not even knowing we would have the wins in 1997 and 1998. Uh, so um, finally to Karen Hanson Kuhn, uh, who uh, when Maud brought Canadians to the US for the NAFTA fight, this incredible coalition of women's groups, farmers, labor, environment, so on. And then Manuel and others brought up a similar coalition from Mexico and said, you know, where's your coalition? Um, we didn't have one. <laughs> But uh, Karen became the leader of the network of groups that that interacted with our Canadian and and Mexican counterparts. So that's how she got to know Maude. And it's great to have her. And she's with the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. 
So Karen Hensley. Well, thank you. But we all built that network. Um, I have to say, though, it is funny how far we've come. And thinking back to those days, I remember one of the early meetings hearing some of the Canadians thought the Americans were puppets of US government. Some of the Mexicans thought the Canadians were gringos in overcoats, you know, and we did have some work to do, right, to, to build those bridges. And I'm, we're still close to many of those people so many years later. Like I was, I was talking with a trade activist a few years ago who was moaning about we always lose, right? And I said, well, what about the free trade area of the Americas? We won on that one. And, and he didn't even know because sometimes, for one thing, we don't celebrate our victories enough, I think, not publicly enough. Um, but also, I think the win there was partly, it was partly defeating something that would have been so harmful to millions of people in our environments. But it was also the coalitions we built. I mean, there were literally millions of people in 20 some countries coordinating activities to make this happen. And even so many years after that debate, those relationships are still there. Um, anyway, what I was gonna ask you, uh, I, I loved the book and I read it bit by bit for sort of moments of hope over the last couple of weeks. And I, and I loved all the quotes in the book, you know, that, that I would reflect on in the day. And the one I liked the best, I think, I mean, there were many, but at the end, it says, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start from where you are and change the ending by C.S. Lewis. I really liked that. I appreciated that. And also, because there's so many times things change course, we make decisions to change course. I find as I get older, I like to be surprised. I like sometimes when things don't turn out the way I thought they were going to. And I wonder if you could talk about sometime things didn't turn out the way you thought they were going to, or someone took an action, decided to change the ending in a way you hadn't expected. Wow, that's interesting. That's a really, that's a, <clears throat> John said earlier, if you're, if you're stunned, I'll jump in. Because <laughs> that's a really interesting question. I, well, first of all, Karen, I want to say thank you. And it's just been such a joy to work with you all these years. And um, I agree with you. If somebody didn't know the free trade area of the Americas, um, we lose our history if we don't write it down. It's one of the reasons I write books. It's one of the reasons John, uh, uh, you know, uh, wrote and Robin wrote uh, The Water Defenders. If we don't write this down, we lose our history. And I feel a kind of urgency about making sure that it's, it's there. I find that a lot of young activists, particularly climate activists, don't know anything about any of these struggles or really about economic globalization, <clears throat> don't know about the issues that we fought uh, in, in the International Forum on Globalization and others. So it's really important. So your question is, Say it again. It's it's. Uh, have I been let 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 down by some uh, an expectation not coming? No, maybe. Have you been a pleasant surprise? Things turning out better than you thought it would. Oh, a pleasant surprise. Or I was looking for the negatives. <laughs> I didn't find be, it. There's some a lot in the book. Yeah. Oh, did you know, Maude? I mean, let me just ask, because you write about in the book, you had the big three big wins, fast track, MAI, multilateral agreement on investments, and then Seattle, which we consider a victory because yeah. it was a yeah. defeat for them. Yeah. Um, did you, were any of those surprises or were they all surprises? I guess everything's a surprise at the size of it. Um, are you, John, you'll remember standing up at the Benaroya Hall uh, opera center in in uh, in Seattle. The first night we had a teach-in just before the the, the uh, ministerial meeting was to start, and until then I didn't think we you know people said we're going to shut it down, and I thought mm -mm. and there were three thousand people, and the energy in that room could have I mean there's your replacement to fossil fuels was was in that room that night, and I remember standing up and just saying oh they should be worried like I knew that that night we were going to do it. Where I was really surprised, Karen, was uh, when we stood at the, uh, when I stood in the balcony of the UN General Assembly, 
on July 28th, 2010. I didn't think we were going to win. Uh, we were working with, I, I was working with the um, uh, Pablo Solo, who was the, at that time, the ambassador to the UN from Bolivia. And he said, I'm going to put the, the case to the General Assembly. And everybody was saying, not me, but lots of people in the movement and also <clears throat> many allies in different countries were saying, we're not ready. And Pablo said, how could you not be ready to defend the right of children not to die of, of waterborne disease? How is that possible? So he just said, and, and, he, and people said, well, then keep sanitation out of it. Just, just talk about the human right to water because sanitation, of course, costs money and that's where you're gonna get stopped by governments. My country, Canada, at the time, led the fight against the human right to water at the UN. Um, the US was opposed. And by the way, when Obama came in and joined the Human Rights Council, they, the US changed its position. Most people don't know that the US did in fact endorse um, that resolution um, just a couple of months later. Uh, Great Britain was opposed, the World Bank was opposed, the big companies, the bottled water companies, the food companies, the utility companies, all opposed. I was sure we were going to lose. And I stood in the balcony with several staff who were in tears just saying, we're going to lose. And and because and I, you know, at the UN, when you vote, it goes up on the screen and they vote electronically, you know, instantly. And I was sure we were going to lose. And in fact, 141 countries voted in favor. Uh, not one voted against. They didn't have the courage. They abstained, 42 abstained. And I remember uh, Pablo Solo came up to the balcony and stood there like this. And one after another, the countries that were angry with them turned, including mine, including the US ambassador and said, we weren't ready for this and you shouldn't have pushed it. And Pablo stood there with this shit eating grin on his face, like as if to say, and what part of I just won and you didn't, uh, are, you know, are you not grasping here? It was just like a sweet, 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 sweet moment. Um, but I'll tell you, this relates to the earlier question that Mitch asked. I was all ready for us not to win and for us to say, I said to my team before the vote, We'll be back in five years. We'll be back in ten years. We're not going to let this go. This can't. This this you know one of the most urgent crises of our time. Um, and I remember saying to myself, "Long haul. We're in here for the long haul." And then just marvelously surprised. Yes, at at, at that surprise victory. It was a sweet, sweet moment. I can tell you. I'm curious if any of the rest of you have things that you wanted to ask Maude or that have come up as you've listened. Um, the audience uh, is writing little love notes to you here, um, Maude, but they're not asking questions. Uh, David uh, Corton wrote, your words remind me how much I need your message. I get so uh -huh. focused on how far we have yet to go that yeah. I find myself constantly struggling against despair. It is easy to miss uh, how much extraordinary progress is being made. So I look forward to reading the book and getting it. That's a nice plug for the book. So I want to plug the book, but any of any of the rest of you want to get in for one more time here, let me ask, just open it up to you all. You know, maybe it would be take a minute to think about how we're going to use hope to deal with the situation the violence in many places, but most particularly in Ukraine. <clears throat> and, you know, again, you can, I don't mean pretend it's not happening, but we can talk about hope and the other issues that are in the book and the Ukraine-Russia situation is not in the book. I actually was able to get my publisher, sweet publisher, to keep it open long enough to get through COP26. I said, I cannot have a book coming out on this issue and not talk about what happens at COP26. And they said, Arg, you've got a book coming out in early March. There's no way we can wait, you know? And I said, please, 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 please. And so anyway, so it was, it was really quite up to date. I was writing right into December, but obviously not this war. Yeah. Uh, and finding ways to cope with the horror of it and wanting to bear witness, but not be overwhelmed by it and wondering how it's going to shape geopolitics and worrying, and here's a worry, about what it's going to mean for our fight on climate, because there's already new talk about Keystone XL. We've got the premier of uh, Alberta, our most right-wing province, saying, <clears throat> let's go, you know, Europe needs this. And suddenly it's, you know, our ethical oil compared to the, the Russian oil, not as if we can get it there really fast. Yeah, first of all, build a pipeline and get it over there. Um, but just the, 
I guess just thinking about um, applying, and I thought about this, oh no, goodness, this book on hopes coming out as this awful thing is unfolding. And then I thought, as I said a few minutes ago, um, that's the time for hope. This is the time when you, it's the uncertainty that um, several of you talked about and that's central to, to hope that you just simply can't make the assumption um, that things are going to work in a particular way. Um, and, and anything you can do to any person, it might have nothing to do with it there, but just in your own, I don't know how to say this, it doesn't sound corny, being as kind and mindful as we can in all of our personal dealings while this is upon the earth um, and while people are struggling so hard, I think is, um, is just incredibly important. It's just going back to the, the kindness and I'm tough as nails on the issues. I don't give a centimeter or an inch for you guys, um, but uh, finding ways to help us through the ugliness of the clashes of the, uh, I don't even think it's left, right, the, the uh, right wing populism uh, that's so sh shocking for us. And I, what, you know, what are you talking about? Where does this, where did this hatred come from? I, I was um, talking to my, one of my 16, my 16 year old grandson. And I don't know if you've heard one of the things that they, the way that the, the right populist right it has helped dealt with things in this country is that Trudeau's a dictator. So 16 year old grandson says, all oh, the big joke in our school is dictator Trudeau. And I said, sit down, <laughs> we're gonna talk about this. He didn't understand. He didn't think it was either funny or not funny. He didn't understand it. It's that language that enters into our discourse and enters into young people and, and how, how we counter it and how we stay hopeful. And a lot of it's just doing what you did tonight, just being loving and kind to your Canadian friend and celebrating the work that we do together and, and celebrating the victories we've had and commiserating on the, the ones that we lost and, uh, and, and honoring this work. It's, it's, um, I say to young people when I speak to them, it's the best life. It is the best life uh, above all. Uh, you get up in the morning caring about something other than yourself. And as I said earlier, I'm convinced it keeps you healthier body and soul. And um, I just love you guys. And I wanna thank you very, very much for having been putting this on for me and all the wonderful people who joined. Um, thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you, Maude. And I don't, um, uh, da I know David is trying to ask a bigger question. So we'll, we'll see if he takes a moment to write it down. But I'm curious if any of the others want to quickly respond to this. We have like seven minutes left here. I, I do wanna, you know, as you were speaking, as Ukraine has unfolded, these other things have happened that have been largely off screen that people said could never happen. So in Honduras, um, a horrible 12 year narco fascist government was about to get reelected and everyone would say the opposition can't win. And the opposition won, the number three candidate dropped out of the race and backed the number two candidate. And then miraculously, she won by a landslide enough so that they couldn't steal it back. And then she stopped new open pit mining. This in Honduras, which, which any of us would have said is one of the two most hopeless places in Latin America, that happened in November. And then in December, a country, you know, racked by fascism, Chile, elects a student activist as its president and is getting ready to pass a const well, to finish a constitution that will truly revolutionize constitutions. It'll have the right to water, the rights to nature, Amazing. a new level of LGBTQ rights and a whole bunch of other stuff. Who could have imagined that in a country which was run by a dictator for 17 years and a cool guy who's gonna end fracking and a bunch of mining is likely to win in Colombia in May and Lula <laughs> who lost three times <laughs> before he won. Uh, is almost certain to win in Brazil in October. Um, and yes, there's the Ukraine and yes, there's, um, you know, setbacks elsewhere, but um, imagine that and the human resilience to make that happen. So part of it is not just learning from the past, it feels, strikes me, but learning from other parts of the world that aren't on the front pages right now because Ukraine is. 
Um, but anybody else uh, want to uh, any any words here on this? I know it's <laughs> it's big and it's sort of heavy. Um, but before we close up, uh, if not, uh, so you just all have to buy the dang book. Uh, Maud, is it easy to buy in the United States? Maud sent us all copies. Um, and I know we've been putting links up in the chat, so you can go there and I'm sure buy it. Um, it's not in bookstores in the US. It just right. came up here. So it's in bookstores here, but no, you- <clears throat> no, we can order it. We can order it from your publisher though. Absolutely, or go to your favorite independent bookstore that I always like right. doing, getting them to order it. I know people in the U.S. who have gotten their hands on it, Maud, so it must be leaking through the border. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the border is open again. Best kind of trade. <laughs> Thank all you right. all very much. I deeply appreciate it. Loved okay. You. Yes, thanks so much, all of you. Thanks to the co-hosts. Thanks to the audience. Thanks to you also on Facebook. Uh, be well, all of you. And we'll be back for the 21st uh, book in not too long, I'm sure, all of us together. Thank you, John. Okay. Thank you, Maud. <laughs> Bye. Thank Bye. you, Maud. Thanks, John. <laughs> See you all soon.